White Zombie was the first zombie film ever produced in the United States or any other country. Uh, released in the summer of 1932, White Zombie actually came on the crest of a what was beginning to be a horror cycle in the United States. It had begun with Dracula and Frankenstein in 1931, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and Murders in the Rue Morgue. Uh, actually, when the film was released in the summer of 1932, White Zombie, there was a lot of discussion in the film industry about whether the popular horror films would continue to be popular, whether they would continue to be made. The phenomenal success, actually, the financial success of White Zombie helped ensure that horror films continued to be popular throughout the 1930s. In addition to being the first zombie film, the uh, movie White Zombie is interesting in that it did not have a prior literary source as Dracula, Frankenstein, and other horror films had. There was no zombie book, no famous zombie piece of literature to refer to, so the film, which was scripted by Garnet Weston, becomes really kind of a pastiche of various sources patched together uh, for the purposes of the film. Director Victor Halperin, who had begun making films in the late teens, was quite uh, well known in the industry, but not to the general public, often uh, using his full name, Victor Hugo Halperin, which he for forewent in for the case of this film. The movie is beginning in a scene, a carriage ride in the country of Haiti, and uh, in that way actually echoes uh, the beginning sequences of Dracula with a carriage ride, a travel by carriage in a foreign land, a very common in horror films and uh, also, in fact, putting U.S. citizens in foreign countries would become popular in the 1930s horror film, almost echoing, in a way, U.S. sentiments uh, that stemmed out of the 1920s, anti-immigration sentiments, actually, uh, that we see, where villains would often be of uh, clearly European descent, and U.S. citizens would be forced to contend with them. all the time. The burial in the road sequence, which is occurring now, actually does stem from one of the many sources for White Zombie, a 1929 nonfiction book called The Magic Island. And uh, that, that particular book discusses burials in roads. This is where the film draws from that source. Uh, we see these carriage rides, and Clarence Muse, the actor who pays, plays the carriage driver, isn't actually the one driving the horses in these scenes, even though he, he plays the carriage driver. He, he was unable to drive a team of horses. The Lugosi eyes, which we've just seen, uh, actor Bela Lugosi playing a character named Murder in this film, uh, we begin with the shot of his eyes actually uh, disconnected from his body. You know He's now is, uh, meeting the uh, young hero and heroine of the tale. And uh, we, we see in his eyes, the, they're often omnipresent throughout the film, uh, penetrating, really, in a sexual sense. And they also invoke folk tales uh, that are known throughout the world of evil eyes and uh, begin to play off to uh, yet another of the film's myriad of sources, uh, Du Maurier's Trilby in which um, Svengali's eyes control uh, Trilby. He has taken the heroine's scarf here, and uh, that actually echoes yet another of the film's sources, uh, Goethe's Faust, in which uh, Faust, in his zeal, his lust for the woman he desires, suggests to Mephistopheles, uh, fetch her kerchief, and that's a moment that we see imitated uh, in this film. We also have just been a witness to the first shot of the zombies under the control of murder, the Lugosi character. The meeting we just saw invokes also yet another prior source, the 1921 film Destiny, Fritz Lang's film Destiny, which uh, has a similar meeting between death, the embodiment of death, and a young couple in that film. We're about to get the most, one of the most important moments, I believe, in the film, a moment in which we hear the definition of zombies. We might have been caught. Caught? The actor playing the carriage driver, Clarence Muse, was quite well known in 1932. He was uh, not only a well-known actor, but uh, a composer and lyricist. He wrote, uh, was co-wrote, actually, Louis Armstrong's theme song, When It's Sleepy Time Down South. He was very well thought of by much of white America, despite the 
predominantly racist views of the time and some of the racial encounters he had in real life actually white america would stand up for him so the fact that we get a very dignified and very strong well-known actor telling us the definition of zombies and zombieism uh, is i believe important and helps us especially if we were 1932 audiences in understanding in believing in finding credible the idea of zombies we see a figure approaching who is shown to us now especially in those opening sequences as looking very similar to the Lugosi character which is curious uh, because even though he was silhouetted similar hat he's really the antithesis of the Lugosi character murder this is Dr. Bruner the missionary portrayed by Joseph Cawthorn Cawthorn was another well-known actor at the time very popular in the Hollywood social scene uh, although often better known for his comedy portrayals uh, and stage portrayal, certainly not horror type roles. Sure, you don't believe it, do you? No. <laughs> the two yeah, young know. actors we have are uh, both remnants of the silent film era, which had uh, disappeared only about five years before uh, the release of White Zombie. John Heron, who was the brother of the well known silent screen actor Bobby Heron. Uh, Heron himself, though, John Heron, never really found much success at all. Madge Bellamy, the young actress, however, was quite well known and very well thought of during the silent film era in such films as Lorna Doone. By 1932, she, though, was uh, a really uh, a leftover from the past, trying desperately to make a comeback. I've been sent for to marry someone. Horror films of the time often used comedic relief to uh, allayed some of the fears that were believed uh, occurring in audiences. This is probably a leftover of some of the stage plays that combine comedy and horror from the teens and twenties old Ark House stage plays. We see here with the smoking of Dr. Bruner's uh, what will be the repeated comedic motif of White Zombie, him consistently wanting a match to light his pipe or being told he can't smoke and so forth. Oh, Madeline and I planned to be married the moment she arrived. But Mr. Beaumont persuaded us to come here. And he promised to take me out of the bank at Fort Hall Prince and send me to New York as his agent. Hmm. Strange. Very strange. You Very similar to most uh, horror films of the time, the indeed most films, uh, we see our wonderful hero, John Heron, who plays a very ineffectual, uh, indeed impotent male hero, dressed solely in white, uh, actor John Carradine once said that movies of this period in general were black and white, not only in the quality of the film, the lack of color, but in the characters that heroes were generally too good to be true or so awful they were unbelievably bad. And we see our young hero here, John Heron, playing Neil in that capacity, dressed solely in white. The butler who we see peering in and out of the scenes is Brandon Hurst, a well-known character actor of the time. He had been in such films as the 1923 Hunchback of Notre Dame, the 1928 The Man Who Laughs. Uh, he had even been in Murders in the Rue Morgue in 1932 with Bela Lugosi, a horror film immediately prior to White Zombie. Show them to their room and tell them I'm out. No the way. introduction in this scene comes of our anti-hero, the Beaumont character, per portrayed by Robert Frazier. Uh, Frazier had uh, himself been involved in early films. He played the title roles in 1912's Robin Hood and 1913's Rob Roy. Many other films had starred him as well. He, by 1932, though, uh, probably even more so than Madge Bellamy, was long past his prime, long past his fame and uh, relegated now to an independently made film, which White Zombie was. Victor Halperin, the director of the film, actually had a predilection for using silent screen actors in his uh, sound films. That would, he, would, he would do this in, in films subsequent to White Zombie, and we certainly see it in White Zombie with Frazier, the character here, Beaumont, and Madge Bellamy. 
The room we're seeing actually shows us a great number of signifiers of the Beaumont character, the, the firearms, the knives on the wall, all symbols of his presumed sexual prowess. Also, we, we, by his clothes alone, we see an almost imperialist figure, somebody who is indulging in the wealth of another country. Uh, U.S. citizens in 1932 would have had strong feelings about Haiti, the location of this film, because of U.S. military intervention, which had begun in the teens, and something still very much in the papers in 1932. Uh, U.S. sentiment in general, especially in white America, was uh, against Haiti, but later turned against military intervention. Uh, quite a mess, really, and those sentiments would have resonated in the minds of citizens in the U.S. watching this film in 1932. This is an interesting se sequence here where we see the Beaumont character who has clear romantic intentions, sexual intentions for the Madeline character portrayed by Madge Bellamy, and yet we're continually cutting away to the John Heron character, Neil. He is being shown, in other words, in, in shots by himself, which shows all the more clear his, his isolation, his solitary status from her, which will actually foreshadow what will be uh, become a reality later in the film. Another zombie appears, and we earlier heard the discussion between Beaumont and the butler, Silver, uh, about what they call that other person, that man, referring mysteriously to the character of murder. Uh, again, played by Bela Lugosi, because we, we try through the dialogue to heighten the mysterious, the supernatural qualities of that character. Here are a young hero in this sequence, John Heron, uh, portraying Neil, will go out onto his terrace and, and see again for himself uh, a zombie again. He's seen some earlier in the evening. He will see them again, one in particular here, that will take Beaumont to murders sugar mill. The pan from screen right to left from Beaumont to the blank uh, staring zombie and then back to Beaumont acts itself as a kind of foreshadowing of what will become Beaumont's fate later in the film. Murder's Sugar Mill. Uh, we see here something highly, I believe, highly sophisticated for 1932. People often remark, critics, both modern and in 1932, remark about the often silent screen quality of White Zombie. And while that's true in many ways, this sequence shows how Victor Halpern was indeed really a master, an early master of the use of, of sound effects to convey mood. And although this sequence certainly is silent, we're seeing already some of the more artistic composition uh, in the film, but uh, we, we, we get orally a strong use of sound effects of that grinding sugar mill, uh, which will indeed uh, dismember a zombie soon who will fall into it. We, we get a, a very strong use of sound and sound effects in this movie, far more competent, far more sophisticated than most other films of the period. The sugar mill itself actually again stems from the 1929 nonfiction book, The Magic Island, which was about Haiti, that I mentioned earlier. The book, The Magic Island, was written by William Bueller Seabrook and spoke of zombies in Haiti in one chapter, in particular their use as cheap labor in sugar mills and in sugar plantations. And that's what uh, I believe uh, was the impetus for this scene. We saw uh, something else interesting in this scene already, and we see it again as the zombies turn the, the mill, the millstone. Some of these zombies are actually African Americans. Some of them are white actors in blackface, which is uh, certainly an unfortunate and regrettable aspect of that moment in, in film history. But indeed, I think overall we will see that the racial dimension of white zombie is not as derogatory or as negative as it well could have been or as many films of the period were. Many people when the film came out even speculated that the title White Zombie had racist connections, though it will find later it does not. Beaumont's being introduced to murder who extends a hand and in both opening shots that he meets with murder 
we see only that hand. Legendre, murder Legendre, the character introduced by objectification, his hand alone, his hand which will have uh, great implications as the film moves forward. Arthur Martinelli, the cinematographer of this film, often worked with the director, Victor Halperin, and as we see the two characters through the various bottles on the shelf, we begin to see more and more of the very artistic uh, imagery of the film, and often poetic imagery of the film. The bottles, the surroundings, if we, if we had seen earlier surroundings in Beaumont's room to be signifiers of his sexual prowess, of his imperialist nature, we in Legendre's office begin to get an indication of uh, what are basically science-related materials, uh, almost alchemical in nature, because however mysterious, however potentially supernatural he is, we, we begin to get an impression that he delves into alchemy and uh, early sciences. If a moment ago I suggested that we would see that the film's racist implications really aren't there, certainly not in the way that some may have taken the title in 1932, White Zombie. White, we'll find, refers solely to uh, Madge Bellamy, but not her, not her ethnicity, but instead her virginity, her innocent qualities, and the fact that she is going to be a bride in this film. The scarf, the kerchief uh, that Legendre, murder Legendre, earlier held up uh, is, is itself a signifier of those qualities, those virginal qualities that Beaumont so lusts for. What is occurring in this sequence, if again I would suggest there was no particular literary source for the film and it instead was a combination of various sources, this sequence I believe draws more heavily than any other from Faustian legends, the Faustian bargain with Satan, with Mephistopheles, in particular drawing on Goethe's version of the tale in which Faust, in this case Beaumont, the character Beaumont suggests that he will sacrifice anything for what he desires, the woman he desires. Legendre, murder Legendre, who in fact even looks a great deal like a Mephistopheles character in his makeup, uh, very similar to uh, photographs to images, uh, both in editions of Goethe's Faust, artwork in editions of Goethe's Faust, both in photographs we know from the 1920s of of, of no. opera stars like the Russian no. Chalayapin, who portrayed Mephistopheles on stage. The makeup of Lugosi in this role is even very much like Mephistopheles in those prior depictions. And so what we're seeing, in fact, I believe, is, is essentially an adaptation, molded for the purposes of this film, but an adaptation of that Faustian bargain drawing from Goethe. Another interesting aspect of this scene, though perhaps even more familiar to 1932 audiences, would have been Murder's comment, earlier comment, about the zombies who do not mind working long hours. Uh, that would have probably had implications for 1932 audiences, well familiar with growing unionization, demands always for an eight-hour workday, even the very tens of thousands of coal miners striking in 1932 because of those problems. That would have been you something probably in the mind of many mind. 1932 viewers hearing the comment that Legendre made. We, we will see a lot of interesting breath arising from the mouth of Legendre, murder Legendre in this scene too, but while an interesting effect, it's probably as much as anything a, 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 an index of the independent film it. status of White Zombie, shot in only 11 days, only $62,500, very modest sum. We were working both day and night to finish on schedule, and so we're probably seeing actually in that breath uh, a scene shot at nighttime, uh, just to simply finish on schedule. This sequence, which in which uh, Madeline. Uh, the Madge Bellamy character is pre is preparing for a wedding is is an obvious attempt at exploitation something uh, that uh, Bellamy had was was known for to a degree in a few of her silent films uh, an attempt to titillate 
Uh, but if anything, it, it reinforces what's often the true of the heroines in 1930s horror films. It's, it's not what they do, but rather what's to be done with them. They become the quarry, the hunted, the prey, the desired item or object to gain. You can raise me up to paradise. As she will soon be talking here with Beaumont, uh, we, we get a sense of what so many 1932 critics and even more modern critics have commented on, that Bellamy, who will become a zombie, seems, given her poor acting, zombie-like, even before she becomes one, that it's even hard to tell when, when, where one stops and the other begins. Uh, her acting very much outdated even by 1932 standards however much some other actors are overstating overplaying she herself is is clinging to a more silent style of acting and reinforced actually by Halperin's own request director Halperin's requests she's holding flowers she is about to be given a flower by Beaumont in which is the zombie powder he has obtained in his Faustian bargain with Legendre this will become a repeated motif in the film because she will be often likened to a flower, itself a sexual image, of course, and uh, these floral references will occur throughout, and she will, she will be a flower, a flower to be tainted, a flower with whom to have sexual relations. We are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company, to join together... To Interestingly, uh, Bellamy actually claimed in some of her uh, memoirs that she was dubbed during the making of this film. But oral evidence, not only visual evidence of watching this particular movie, but oral evidence of her later talking films, few that she made, suggests that she is at the least mistaken. The scene we are watching now with Legendre in uh, silhouette, he is about to transform, help transform Madeline into a zombie, is one of the most complex and important in the film. We get a highly sophisticated use of background music, far more than we've seen in any other horror films to date by this time in 1932. But most importantly, we get what we're already seeing. We're getting Legendre looking directly at us, directly at the audience viewer. And uh, this is something that is rarely seen in films, even, at, even by the teens, characters looking directly into the lens. But when they do, generally speaking, their glance is associated with another character on screen, it's somebody in whose point of view we are placed. But note, in this case, Legendre, Legendre whose very signifier is that of death, is that of the vulture, Legendre will look directly at us and he will be looking at us, not another character, not a glance associated with another character. And to a small degree, we are, unlike most other horror films, most other indeed films of any kind in any era, we become to a small degree a character in the drama, what I would call the spectator as character. We become, depending upon our point of view, a lackey of Legendre's who can enjoy watching his exploits, especially given the poor acting of some of the heroes, we might enjoy them not getting out of their horrible plight. He looks at us often, we might be scared, we might fear for becoming a zombie ourselves. Uh, we might simply just laugh at all of the nonsense that's going on, but regardless, we, we attempt, or I, I should say the film attempts to incorporate us into it as a character, a silent character, but a character nonetheless. If Legendre's signifier, I say, say a moment ago, is that of the vulture of death, we've already seen that, well, among other things, he is the keeper of souls, the keeper of zombies. We, we hear Bellamy in this scene, who sees him appear in her glass of wine, that she sees death. I said even earlier that a sequence when Legendre first meets the young couple in the carriage harkens back to Fritz Lang's destiny in which the embodiment of death is a character. I'm suggesting through all of these references that in many ways murder Legendre, indeed even his first name, murder, uh, suggests that perhaps, perhaps, and we're never sure, but perhaps he is an embodiment of death, the keeper of the dead, the keeper of corpses back to life. 
Again, the music, which grows more and more sophisticated, is a wonderful collection that was put together by Abraham Meyer, who often helped out independent filmmakers of the time with cheap, inexpensive scores, often blending classical uh, music. In this sequence, we hear uh, 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 various selections melded into one, including a few moments of Mussorgsky's pictures in an exhibition. Uh, uh, but, but however inexpensive the music may have been, Victor Halpern, the director, makes the most of it in, in this, which is certainly his finest film. He makes the most of music and playing off music and remembering how strong music worked with the silent films he so loved. Uh, the music, the sound effects, is far superior to other prior horror films. Again, as the sequence ends, the, the importance of the glance, the glance which sexually penetrates Madeline in a Freudian sense, the glance which again looks to us, looks to us, the audience, as the scene ends, as Legendre stares at ourselves, a character in the unfolding madness. The funeral sequence goes even further with what this idea that I'm referring to of the spectator as character as we become placed within the very tomb that Madeline's body, her presumed dead body, is being placed. We are not in the casket, though, so we are certainly not sharing her point of view. Rather, we, we are sharing the point of view of, of perhaps someone who is endangered, ourselves, the spectator as character. The sequence of Neil, the, the John Heron character, in this pub is quite interesting. The background music in this case was uh, composed for the film uh, by Xavier Cugat, who would later uh, become quite famous for his rumba music and for, among other things, being married to Charo. Uh, the sequence, though, is, again, I believe, a very sophisticated one to show Neil's isolation, his despair, his mourning, all the more in a heightened sense. We place him in a pub in a social setting, but to accentuate how removed he is from everyone else, they are seen only in shadows, enjoying themselves. We hear them laughing. We see them dancing. Neil, though, is apart from all others. He is plagued by the memories of Madeline, who appear to him in the superimpositions that we see. This sequence also shows what was common in some ways in horror films, because however unique, however wonderful the, the visual acumen of this moment, it, it does suggest what so often happened to the male heroes of the horror films. Coitus Interruptus, uh, that the villain has taken their woman, their heroine, from them. The scene in the cemetery that we have just begun with Legendre and Beaumont about to be uh, about to meet the zombies of the cadre, the phalanx of zombies, and under murderous command, introduces to the audience the first time the zombies in a particularized way in which we even go so far as to hear their names and hear about their their personalities. This is something quite interesting because again we must wonder is is this even a supernatural oh. film? We've already learned that, well, Le Genre bears qualities yeah, with the job. idea of death, death embodied, that figure. He shares qualities with Mephistophelian yeah, figures of the past, in Goethe's Faust, for example. But I is he the devil? Is he death? Is he, are the zombies even supernatural at all? We, we speak about them uh, in a way as dead bodies. We heard that earlier from the carriage driver. We know now, though, that Madeline was transformed into zo a zombie by the zombie powder, and uh, we we even hear in this sequence that if they regain their soul, or rather regain their consciousness, they would destroy murder, which suggests to us that he is not immortal. He can be killed. We also begin to realize that the zombies are, are living persons whose minds, whose souls, to a sense, have been taken from them by this zombie powder. Dracula, the subsequent films like The Mummy of 1932, Dracula's Daughter, there would be a few supernatural films in the 1930s horror genre, but the bulk of the 1930s horror film would pit religion versus science in films like Frankenstein and the many other mad scientist movies. 
why Zombie Stains is unique because it has those elements pitting religion, the religion of Dr. Brunner, the missionary, against the almost alchemical uh, voodooism of murder. Uh, but we also get a, a kind of sense of the fantastic, as the French theorist Todorov has spoken of, the idea that, well, the fantastic rests in that world between knowing whether something's supernatural or not. Because in this film, I believe, especially through the bulk of it, we're never quite sure if the supernatural is at play. And it's that hesitation, that not knowing, that becomes more interesting, I think, in a sense, than, than a Dracula where we know the supernaturals at play, or a Frankenstein where it's clearly not at all. In this film, we're, we're never really sure. The Legendre character, we might again suggest, however closely Jack Pierce, the famous makeup artist who had done the makeup for Dracula in 1931 and Frankenstein's monster in 31, would later do makeup for The Wolfman and many, many other films, uh, designed the makeup. It very much does resemble, as we said earlier, Mephistophelian images, but the, the wide plantation-style hat, uh, the the dress uh, also resembles some of the sketches in the 1929 travelogue I mentioned earlier, The Magic Island. So some of those uh, pieces of artwork in that text, that 1929 text, I believe, were also used to design the costume for Legendre. Bela Lugosi in this sequence, I believe, actually in a hand motion we see, if it seems at least unsure of his stage direction, at, at worst, perhaps, he, he has, has not performed that well in a take, a take which is kept probably because of the independent uh, status of the film. As the zombies take Madeline's body, though, we see images, this first image, uh, which I think is very reminiscent of Caspar David Friedrich's paintings, the German romantic paintings of the 19th century. Uh, highly visual, highly stunningly visual uh, aesthetics at this moment, visuals, uh, which it's hard to attribute really their origin. Victor Halperin, the director, Arthur Martinelli, the cinematographer, both worked together many, many times and, and never again created any visuals in any film, any other kind of film, nearly as stunning, as memorable as in White Zombie. So whether we give blame or, or rather I should say uh, uh, praise to them both, or individually is, is a difficult question to answer. As Neil screams when he discovers that Madeline's body's been taken, we again see the a very interesting use of off-screen sound, off-screen action. There's two explanations to strike me. The fact he learns the Madeline's body, body has stolen been stolen, though, takes him to Dr. Bruner. You, we see Dr. Bruner, Bruner through the arch in Neil's body, and this begins what I, I must speak very highly of as, as one of the more interesting shots I've seen in any 1930s film, certainly in a 1930s horror film. This sequence is several minutes long, yet it's all in one take. One take of, of constantly moving camera, moving actors, very, very well blocked out. This is, this is something we normally don't see in films of the period. It actually prefigures the kind of work that Alfred Hitchcock would do in 1948's Rope, where, where the camera roves, follows the actors move, uh, but the, the cuts aren't made. The, the take is one long continuous piece of action. Very, very interesting. And, and because it's so well done, it becomes seamless in a sense. It would, it's easy to watch the film the first time and not notice how, how sophisticated, especially for 1932, uh, the moving camera work, especially in these earlier days of sound, how sophisticated this sequence is because of all what is on the surface, a kind of simplicity. The over-the-shoulder, I guess I should say, through the, through the arch and the arm of Neil's shoulder and arm, uh, is, is indicates what, what Edward Halperin, the producer and brother of director Victor Halperin, would, would call themselves in interviews audience reciprocality. Uh, the idea that, that they would often try and make the audience associate with a character who's in disbelief of what's going on, a, what they would call a man from Missouri, somebody who says, show me. That would be what they would say in interviews. 
And Neil, portrayed by John Heron, is uh, somebody who performs that activity for them in this film, who doesn't believe Dr. Bruner or the earlier carriage driver. This can't be uh, voodoos. They're certainly not zombies. Uh, questioning the supernatural, questioning these kinds of explanations. He is the uh, embodiment of what the Halperins referred to as audience reciprocality. And the idea, in other words, is that us, the audience, uh, begin to slowly believe in the supernatural at about the same time the uh, character of Neil does. Edward Halperin, the producer, would often work with his brother, Victor Halperin. They had gone to California, actually, at a similar time to, to get into the movies. They had gotten degrees in areas like business. They... They uh, weren't. Ha they had been involved in drama in some smaller ways in college plays and so forth. But they went to California to get involved in the movies. Victor had often worked without his brother, but they often worked together, especially in the 1930s, especially following the huge financial success on Broadway and across the, in most cities across the country of White Zombie. Dr. Bruner, in this sequence, uh, refers to the Haitian law, and in particular Article 249 of the Haitian law, something that yet again borrows from that 1929 nonfiction text, The Magic Island, which played up Article 249, the, this idea that you could be prosecuted if you try and make somebody appear dead, even if they later come back to life, even if they later regain consciousness. This would be something that would be used repeatedly in white zombie publicity and ad campaigns. The ad campaigns for this movie were extremely elaborate. The Ballyhoo efforts, out, both outside the theater, which would often feature theater employees dressed as zombies trying to elicit audience attendance, but also in newspaper ads and posters. Uh, Article 249 would be one of the various uh, techniques used to entice audiences that, that you can be prosecuted if you try and make someone appear dead and, and all of that uh, kind of thing. If I can get my hands on the devil that's responsible for this, I'll make him such an example that every witch doctor in Haiti will be shaken in his boots. Once again, because of the multiple times they work together, and even seeing their work apart, it's difficult to know whether whether highly interesting uh, sequences such as this one were planned by director Halperin, director Victor Halperin, or by cinematographer Martinelli, because their work both together and apart, would never be as interesting as in this film. Indeed, a, a kind of visual plainness accompanies most of their other efforts. And as this sequence closes, we return uh, with this idea of audience reciprocality, hopefully with Neil again in, in an almost similar shot, such that we have caught up as he has with the belief that there are indeed zombies. In the opening scenes of the castle of Ojandre's home, we see some of the magnificent glass shots of the film. Uh, uh, the actual ocean, of course, but a glass shot, uh, which was worked on by the Howard Anderson Company of, of, of Hollywood. Uh, in particular, Conrad Trichler did many of the glass shots that we saw of the exterior of the castle, a castle which did not exist. It was a glass painting. And, and even of the Grand Hall that we're in now, which was a remaining set from Dracula at Universal Studios, where the Halperins uh, rented some, some sets and shot some of the, uh, much of the footage. The bulk of the film was the bulk of the film was actually shot at Universal Studios. And uh, this set was, was uh, part of the Dracula set, but the upper area of it, those upper windows and so forth, are all, are all part of a glass painting matted in uh, by the Howard Anderson Company. Uh, Madeline, who has been revivified, is uh, playing, of course, Litz uh, Liebstrom. And uh, we, we see some interesting things in the castle. We, we saw Beaumont actually sitting in a seat, a seat that we earlier saw in his own home, which is, which is itself probably an economical use of, 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 of set props. Uh, the, the, the very chairs themselves had been seen in earlier films like uh, The Cat and the Canary of 1927. Uh, but, but, the, but interestingly, in a narrative sense, is that we, we see that chair. We'll soon see his butler and his maids all relocated to uh, murder Legendre's uh, castle. And uh, we, we, we begin to see how Legendre, in other words, is, uh, well, 
enjoying his return on the bark and what's, what's a growing control over Beaumont. Beaumont, of course, is, is beginning to realize that Madeline's zombified state is, is something he doesn't enjoy or can appreciate. Uh, and, and one of the reasons, of course, is that, well, she has a lack of consciousness, but on another level, it's, it's because he's, he's beginning to understand that, that the one who has control over her, the one who has gained her, uh, is Murder Legendre. In many ways, this is a film about sexual greed and about sexual possession. And, uh, and because of the fact that Madeline is a zombie, because of the fact gone. that Legendre himself may or may not be uh, dead in some sense, and he is in some ways the embodiment of death, this becomes not only a film about sexual greed, but really about necrophilia as well. I can't bear it However much the sets of Dracula are at work, uh, and, and there's many sources at work in this film, many influences. I think we'll see, and we'll, we'll talk more about this as well, but that the, the film's one lack of influence seems to be, in general, the use of German expressionism that was so such a towering artistic influence over much of 1930s horror films. Though we get shadows, though we get uh, certainly artistic uh, uses of lighting, th this isn't, in general, an expressionist document as uh, Dracula and certainly Frankenstein had been. The floral like composition, which is shot by part of the, the architecture of, of Legendre's castle, uh, is, is most telling because he is in control of you Madeline sexually. And because she is likened throughout to a flower and to floral like images, the sheer fact that we see him walking into that floral composition is itself. Uh, a, a sign of penetration, a sign of sexual control. She, she is a flower, but she is now a tainted flower. She is not the white zombie in the sense of virginity any longer, even if she's still a white zombie in the sense that she was to have been married, and, and indeed was married, as we saw in the scene, uh, right before she, uh, in a sense, died. The very dialogue in the sequence reinforces, I believe, what I'm suggesting in that, in that uh, Legendre will even speak of, uh, let's make a toast to this flower and, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, the, the idea that we're even verbally referring to her in, in that kind of Victorian symbology that, uh, that Halperin, director Victor Halperin, and screenwriter Garnet Weston, Weston both loved. In a, in a sense, Garnet Weston and uh, the scriptwriter and uh, uh, Victor Halpern both not only loved 19th century literature, but, but in many ways were, were carryovers of the 19th century in their, in their interests. Uh, many, many of the films that Halpern would make would be based on 19th century novels, and, and certainly even in those that, that aren't, in his other films and this one, there is a certain kind of uh, 19th century sentimentality at work often. Yeah. Again, in this sequence, we've seen uh, Legendre look, of course, directly at us, this other repeated motif we've introduced earlier. Now, of course, he, he does begin, as Beaumont had earlier offered him, to, to, to take any sacrifice for having uh, transformed Madeline into a zombie, to for, for have, have given him Madeline. But, but he says, it in a sense, that he's taken a fancy to Beaumont. And, and many theorists, and I would agree with them, have suggested that there is indeed a homosexual undercurrent to, to this scene and a subsequent scene between Legendre and Beaumont in which he, he tries to gain control over Beaumont much as he already has Madeline. I have taken a fancy to you. Silver! Silver! The butler, of course, tries to interject himself, and uh, in this sequence, we actually do see a point of view shot in which Legendre's direct gaze into the camera is associated with another character to the degree that the blurred focus attempts to mimic the eyesight of the butler who, is, who has become uh, bewitched 
by Legendre's gaze and is unable to act. Uh, this, again, offers an opportunity for, for some of the zombies to appear and for what will become some of the more interesting visuals of the film. Uh, the larger of the zombies, the six foot six, uh, 250 pound Chauvin, uh, was played by Frederick Peters. Uh, we, we see he, that he is, in a sense, kind of the favored zombie of Legendre. In each of these sequences, he seems to be given more, a little more screen time than the others. Peters had been seen in, in many other films, even though his name was certainly unknown to 1932 audiences. Again, as the, as the butler is being disposed of, we see some very strong visuals, some very strong uses of, of, of light and dark shades which is completely destroyed by the fact that in this scene you'll notice the butler holds his nose as he's dropped into the water, the pan back up, or I guess I should say tilt back up to the zombies, some highly, highly effective visuals, uh, really destroyed by, by what often modern critics in particular have, have commented on as, as, a, as a destructive moment uh, in that, uh, in that uh, Brandon Hurst holds his nose, actor Brandon Hurst holds his nose as he's dropped into that water to be killed. And uh, whether that was noticed at the time by director Halperin, whether it was a take used simply because of the independent uh, status of the film, is unknown, but certainly works the movie. The film itself, of course, has had, in both 1932 and even in, in the late 20th century, an incredibly mm. uh, radically disparate views on the film uh, that have emerged. Uh, some have, have loved the film, some have hated it, Certainly, it was, it was berated by New York critics when it was first released in, in late July of 1932. Um, it, uh, though in, modern, in, a, in a modern sense, carries the same kind of, of, of random different views. Those who proclaim it as a classic, poetic, uh, visually interesting, visually wonderful, Lugosi's best role, uh, and those who claim it's, it's near laughable. This, uh, this sequence, which shows uh, Beaumont and uh, Neil on the way to, or rather, I guess I should say, Dr. Bruner and Neil on the way to the uh, Legendre Castle, exemplifies a, a few interesting things. The, the ox cart we see and the character who gives uh, another character and, and Uanga charm, all of that, I believe, stems from some pages in The Magic Island of 1929. The character there, Pierre, who's even... Uh, giving the other uh, actor the Uanga charms is actually a white actor, Dan Crimmins in blackface. Uh, but the sequence, uh, more importantly, shows uh, the some of the fairy tale aspects of the film because, in a, in a large part, the the film does have a strong fairy tale structure, and and, and this is what often happens in a fairy tale: the quest and the quest to save the the fair maiden or the fair princess, or in this case, uh, the the fair zombie. Uh, but but there is a, a, a fairy tale structure to the film, and an extended argument can certainly be made that that that's the uh, the narrative underpinnings of the piece. The the wipe transition we saw a moment ago will will be something that we'll we'll see more of. Very a very artistic use of wipe transitions rather than straight cuts, rather than dissolves. And, and that was the first one we've seen in this film, in this opening sequence to uh, Neil and Dr. Bruner's quest to the castle. We'll see more and more of those artistic wipe transitions, which I believe is occurring narratively at this moment because we're moving further and closer to what is known as the land of the living dead, the land of the fantastic. And so those artistic wipes help visually reinforce the narrative content. Of course, the Dan Crimmins character, Pierre, here is, is telling Dr. Bruner of the evil spirit man named Legendre. And, and of course, that's a contradiction in terms of spirit man, but it's a contradiction that, that reinforces earlier contradictions of the very mysterious origins of Legendre, of which we earlier spoke. Is he supernatural? Is he not? Is he death? Is he Mephistopheles? Uh, is he just a, a, a man? This uh, 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 moment here that we see 
uh, it was shot uh, not at Universal Studios. The bulk of the film was, even though Universal Studios wasn't involved in the production. Uh, the Halperns rented sets at Universal. This shot, though, was was shot at Bronson uh, Canyon, California. One of the one of the few shots that actually wasn't uh, uh, shot at Universal. And, and again, of course, as, as Legendre's eyes were earlier omnipresent over the countryside, okay. now his, his signifier, the vulture, is, is hovering nearby as, as uh, Dr. Bruner prepares to go to the castle as Neil, ever ineffectual, ever impotent, is, has taken ill and is even unable to, to, to move forward, at least at this moment. Hovers over the house of the living dead. Madeline. Is she there? No. Oh, I must go and see. No, 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 no. Neil, my boy. Please, please lie down and rest. As, as would so often be the case in 1930s horror films, Neil must defer to the, to the wisdom of, 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 of an elder. Uh, it, it occurs with uh, Jonathan Harker and, and Van Helsing in Dracula. It, it will occur with, uh, with so many others, and, and whether it's The Mummy or Mask of Fu Manchu or so many other future uh, horror films subsequent to White Zombie. Uh, that's what's occurring here. Um, at this moment, as Madeline emerges onto the terrace, uh, we begin to hear probably what would have been the most known composition musically, the most recognizable to 1932 audiences, a composition known as Listen to the Lambs. It was written by an African-American composer named Robert Nathaniel Dett. And the composition, which was a, a, a spiritual, uh, which, is, which is itself interesting at this, at this moment uh, because of the, the certainly the lack of, of a Christian environment in which these characters have found themselves in this foreign land uh, with the, this foreign villain. Uh, we, we hear it underneath the split screen of, of Neil, Neil who of course desires a reunification with Madeline. The piece by Det was had been well recorded, uh, Listen to the Lambs, had been uh, well recorded, often heard on the radio. Det himself uh, was uh, a radio figure uh, uh, at the time of the film's release, uh, meaning that he, he often would lead orchestras on live broadcasts. He had also been an academician. Madeline! Madeline. Earlier I had suggested that this was overall not an expressionist document cinematically in visuals. Despite the use of, of darks and light shades, again, I see stronger, uh, more evocative use of, of pre-expressionist images. Again, the German romanticists like uh, Friedrich. Uh, such that uh, such that we really we really don't on the whole get an expressionist film. Probably the closest uh, uh, thing we have in this film to expressionism is is the objectification, the objectification of, of body parts, visual synecdoches, uh, where we where we are introduced and we often see Legendre's hands alone, and and that expressionist gesture, as film theorist Lott Lottie Eisner once called it, that's that's probably the closest thing we get to. Um, to expressionism. In general, though there are light and dark shades, there, there are shadows, they don't seem to carry the same implications of expressionism. And certainly uh, Halperin, who, who had a great love of 19th century art and literature, would have, would have probably had a fondness to reach back to pre-expressionist artistic movements. Uh, the two maids, who again were, were, were ones that uh, were Beaumont's maids who have relocated to Legendre's castle, are, are themselves interesting. The, the shorter of the two, Annette Stone, this seems to be your only film credit. The taller of the two, though, Velma Gresham, made a few other films, a completely unknown actress uh, who achieved no success at all. But it's interesting because she actually uh, developed an idea of having Memphis stockholders take stock in her. In other words, they, they got together $20,000 to own parts of Velma Gresham uh, and support her, in other words, as she tried to become a star. So that even though she didn't uh, at all and was not an actress of any note, her, her very idea uh, was, was well ahead of its time, really, to sell pieces basically of herself. Again, in, in this sequence, as, as, as Beaumont and Legendre are together again, we, we uh, see 
uh, again, homosexual yeah, undercurrents yeah, as uh, Legendre has uh, taken control of Beaumont. But interesting, too, is that this is the only time in the film that we really see somebody go through the, the various stages towards uh, becoming a zombie. We saw Madeline take a quick faint earlier. But here, Beaumont is, is shaking and struggling. And these, uh, these movements, I believe, because there was no zombie text to rely on, even the Magic Island didn't discuss the uh, physical ramifications of zombification, uh, we had to invent that for the film. And I believe that Beaumont's movements, his gestures, are highly evocative of, of uh, encephalitis lethargica, one of the unfortunate uh, effects of the uh, flu epidemic of 1918, which would have been very much in the minds of people still in 1932, often forgotten today. Of course, it took over a half million victims. And one of the uh, side effects of that epidemic was encephalitis lethargica, which caused very similar symptoms to what we see uh, Beaumont uh, suggesting in his, in his portrayal. Of course, the uh, strong, strong personality, the charisma of Lugosi, which, uh, who was on the crest of, of Dracula and much associated in the audience's minds with the role of Dracula. He had had a huge stage success in 1927 with it on Broadway. His 1931 film uh, portrayal had placed him on the map cinematically. Uh, he uh, uh, had uh, even carried the middle name, so to speak, in white zombie advertising of Bela Dracula Lugosi. His strong acting style, which seems in a sense, certainly to 1932 audiences and critics, it seemed often overplayed, overdone. But, but with time, it seems to have developed a, an even stronger, more unusual uh, flair. In other words, he seems, because of the nature of his character, almost suitable in the kind of acting style he uses, as opposed to the, the farrago of other acting styles we see throughout. Uh, uh, Robert Fraser as Beaumont, uh, overacting in, in the manner of, of silent uh, heavies often, uh, or, or, and just overacting as he's doing in this scene. Uh, Madge Bellamy, who seems, seems almost without, without a soul of any kind, even when she regains hers at the end of the film. Uh, John Heron, who overacts. Everyone seems to be overacting, and, th and that was noticed by a lot of 1932 critics. Uh, with time, it seems, though, that, that that even adds, in a sense, to the kind of fairy tale nature of the film and, and, and the dreamlike qualities of the film. Uh, Madeline will say at the end of the movie, I, Neil, I, I dreamed. And uh, many critics, especially in the recent decades, have noted that the film has a, has a dreamlike quality many even comparing it to the dreamscape of Carl Dreyer's 1931 uh, very visually poetic film Vampire. I, I would take issue with, with that argument because in general there, there does seem to be a strong chronology throughout this movie and there does seem to be strong uh, cause and relational effects in the narrative. The, uh, the use of Lugosi's eyes, as I said earlier, stems from, from many things and not the least of which is the the sexually penetrating factor in a Freudian sense that they carry, the the invocation of evil eye folk tales uh, that they that they use. They, they also, of course, immediately uh, draw on the, the emphasis of his eyes in films like Dracula. Uh, we see them staring at us again here, staring again at us, the audience. He's not looking down at the body of Neil. He's not looking at another character. He's he's staring at us. His hands objectified again, as we've talked earlier. And, and those eyes that we see uh, do draw on his portrayal of Dracula to a sense, uh, his eyes being having been highlighted in that film as well, although in a somewhat different way. Uh, and those were used often, his eyes, in the advertising and publicity campaigns for the film. At this moment, he's, he's of course, summoning uh, Madeline, who awakens to, to do his bidding, presumably, and in this moment, she's not only uh, uh, dressed in a dress with a floral-like image, indeed a very similar clover-like image to the architecture that Legendre earlier walked into, but she even passes a floral arrangement in the immediate vicinity of her genitalia. We're again continuing the floral symbology of the Madeline character and the very clover-like floral image on her dress will be duplicated again as she herself will be framed through that castle architecture that uh, shows the similar uh, clover-like image.
the enormous success of White Zombie uh, did lead to a studio contract for the Halpern brothers, Edward the producer, Victor the uh, director, and they would go on to make another horror film at Paramount Studios called Supernatural. The film failed both aesthetically and economically. Uh, critics of the time dismissed it in general, and uh, the brothers returned to independent filmmaking. They didn't always work together, but, but often they did, especially in the 1930s. And In a sense, they were almost uh, equivalent to the Coen brothers uh, a, a of their time, working in an independent status, working often with limited funds, but producing as a result of their economically limited situation more interesting films. In, in later years, though, the Halpern brothers would become uh, estranged from one another uh, by the by the 60s and 70s they were out of touch the 1960s and 70s uh, Edward had drifted further and further into alcoholism Victor who uh, was removed from the the Hollywood scene he had retired to Arkansas with a second wife uh, basically fell out of contact with his brother as a result at this moment Madeline is apparently going to uh, uh, actually uh, take on a, a sexually strong role herself and penetrate Neil, emasculate Neil in a sense, with a knife. And uh, a knife which will be felled from her hands by uh, an, another objectified hand, as we'll see yet another of the likenings of the missionary, Dr. Bruner, to what should be seen probably as, as, as his, to his uh, antithesis, murder the villain. Uh, but the hand will come from off screen just as Legendre, as he was introduced to Beaumont, extended his hand to shake from off screen. The entire sequence actually mimics very closely a 1921 serial uh, called The Hope Diamond Mystery, which it starred, of all people, Boris Karloff, who would often be seen as Lugosi's arrival uh, in the horror film cycle of the 1930s. The similarity of, of, of Dr. Bruner to Legendre by this point is even such that Legendre is dressed in black uh, that we'll see. Madeline flees. The objectified hands of Legendre work to no avail as he is unable to possess her fully. One of the aspects of White Zombie that we've yet to discuss in full is, the, is how the film drew on uh, Du Maurier's novel Trilby and the sexual control over Trilby that the villain in that novel, Svengali, carried. There had been a 1931 version of Svengali titled such, Svengali, with John Barrymore, which even often placed emphasis on Svengali's eyes, Barrymore's eyes. And this film seems to borrow, as it did from so many other sources, from both the film Svengali from 1931 and the novel on which it was based, De Maurier's Trilby, uh, again, the film is essentially just a, a, a oh patchwork God. of various sources, given that there was no single zombie book on which to base itself. There had been a 1932 uh, play called Zombie, uh, but uh, an investigation of that play, however much it's playwright and star, uh, Pauline Stark liked to claim that White Zombie had, uh, had basically uh, uh, borrowed without credit from it, uh, that's under uh, an investigation of the script of that play uh, is not true, uh, even though the play Zombie may have given the Halperns the idea, hey, let's do a zombie movie, we'll cash in on the horror film. Uh, the play Zombie of 1932, which had died on Broadway, bears little, little similarity at all to White Zombie. As Neil confronts the man, or if, if he is indeed a man, who has taken possession of his bride, uh, we hear Legendre refer to these zombies as the angels of death. And again, we uh, perhaps associate Legendre with, with the figure of death. And, and if zombies themselves are living persons simply affected by the zombie powder, uh, as we've seen with Madeline, we wonder here why they are not then failed by Neil's bullets. Is there again a supernatural quality at play or not? Dr. Bruner, who was introduced by a, a mysterious shadow, uh, perhaps again suggesting that he may not be as diametrically opposed uh, to murder as we had thought, uh, knocks out Legendre 
and as Legendre is weakened, uh, Madeline will regain consciousness to a degree. That again borrows from Trilby, because as Svengali in that novel has headaches, uh, his control mentally over the heroine Trilby is it decreases, and and that's what's happening here. All all three of these people we're seeing on screen: uh, Bellamy, Madge Bellamy, John Heron, Joseph Cawthorn would would find their careers dwindling even further. Bellamy would not have to come back in the talkies she desired as a result of this film. Uh, Heron uh, would not either. Uh, he had never really been much of a star to begin with, certainly not. Uh, Joseph Cawthorn would continue in character roles, but the stars of, of all three, as well as Robert Fraser, Beaumont, would all dim. Only Bela Lugosi would, would continue uh, with, with a large degree of success. His character, Legendre's hero, is relying upon a smoke bomb, which again makes one think perhaps now he's not as supernatural as we had thought if he's relying on only the, uh, a bag of tricks that any, any mortal could possess. But much, much as Faust in, in Goethe's tale tries to, uh, uh, to, uh, to find some way of redeeming himself, so does Beaumont, who, who kills Legendre, or at least a, a very poor uh, uh, dummy, that falls over over the uh, the uh, castle wall, and uh, Beaumont himself, of course, uh, falls. We're we're uncertain really watching whether he purposefully kills himself to redeem perhaps himself, or, or whether he just simply falls. The vulture, the signifier of of Legendre, of course, uh, flew off the castle as as Legendre himself was dead. The veil is, has been lifted to a degree, and we see, as we often will in Halpern's films, a, a, a cutting back and forth between close-ups, which it has a has a kind of a bit of a jump effect, but it, uh, but shows the closeness of, of two characters in a narrative sense. The film, which has reached an end point, would again be a huge success in 1932, despite critical controversy that's continued even to this day.